thank you all for being here. Professor Kelly, you can get us started. Okay, thank you, Kate. Well, greetings, everybody, and thank you all for joining us this morning for this live discussion at AU's School of International Service. We are calling this Hearts, Minds, and Wallets, a conversation on the branding of cities and countries. My name is Professor Robert Kelly. I'm here at the School of International Service, a member of the faculty, and I will be your moderator today. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping issues to go through. Um, first, this discussion will last for about an hour with 15 to 20 minutes towards the end for questions and answers. And you can submit your questions and answers um, using a button at the bottom of your uh, Zoom um, screen here, and uh, I will collect them then. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit it through that function. Closed captioning is available to those who need it, and please click on the option at the bottom of your screens if you'd like closed captioning. We ask that no one record this session, please. We will be recording this webinar, and it will be available on the SIS YouTube channel, and a link will be forthcoming for that. Okay, so um, one more thing before I get started with the panelists. Um, I'm going to ask if um, the uh, attendees wouldn't mind participating in this little word cloud exercise that I'm going to kick off with. It's relevant to our subject matter, but I'm going to post a link here in the chat box. And when you click on that link, it'll take you over here to this uh, website. And uh, what this website will, is prompting you to do is asking you to think of the city of Beijing and tell us in a word or two what associations come to mind. I think this particular site gives you three options. So um, in about a half hour time, 40 minutes time, we'll revisit this site and see what all of you came up with. And I'll continue to prompt in the chat box with that link. Okay, so I think that covers our housekeeping issues. Here's the setup for today's conversation. If you're wondering about the branding of places, look no further than the present time. As the Olympics are getting underway for the second time in 14 years in the Chinese capital of Beijing. As Beijing hosts the games, it's attracting the attention of the world to turn to that city for its close up. And its close up is involving a well rehearsed, orchestrated, and manicured presentation to the world to develop affinity, loyalty, and of course, economic gain towards that city. But what exactly is the notion of place branding, branding of cities and countries? Can it be done like we brand items that we find in the store um, or services? And when it's done, because it is done quite widely, what are the gains? What are the risks? What does it involve? How do we know it's working? So there are so many questions involved with the branding of cities and places and, and countries. And today we are pleased to be joined by a few panelists who will help us answer these questions. So I'd like to introduce the panelists now. Um, our first panelist is Elliot Ferguson. Elliot is president and CEO of Destination DC which is DC's official economic development through hospitality organization. Welcome, Elliot. Thanks, good to be here, Professor. Good to have you. Um, we are also joined by Claire Flannery, who is our vice president, a vice president, of, our vice president, um, vice president of public affairs at Forbes State Partners. Claire works on coalitions, campaigns, and strategic communications. Hi, Claire. Hi, thanks so much for having me today. Looking forward to it. Yes, lovely to have you. And lastly, we are joined by Pavel Surovich, and he is a senior lecturer in strategic communications at the University of Sheffield in the United Kingdom. His latest book is Public Diplomacy and the Politics of Uncertainty. Hello, Pavel. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Thank you for this uh, kind invitation, Robert. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. 
Great, great. Well, it's great to have you too. And uh, being the one who's come the farthest, so to speak, um, I'm going to give you the benefit of the first question here. I think you'll do a, a nice job kind of giving us the, um, the 30,000 foot take on, on place branding. So, Pavel, let me just start with you here. How would you define place branding? Um, well, it, it, it is a good question. Uh, it's a question that is uh, basically a subject of an ongoing debate between academics and practitioners. Uh, it's also a question of uh, ongoing debate between academics of dis different disciplines, and that's what basically makes place branding uh, a really, really interesting and exciting area uh, of both practice and um, uh, political and social theory. Now, uh, in essence, place branding is um, basically a, a practice that focuses on strategic representation of sanitized images of a particular uh, destination, uh, broadly speaking, uh, and that's the reason very frequently the notion of place is emphasized. It can be either uh, a city, and in that particular context, we can talk about city destination branding. Uh, we can talk about nation branding when we talk about, uh, in all fairness, uh, branding of states mm -hmm. as uh, entities in uh, politics, as entities um, uh, that are particularly conducive to uh, competition, uh, uh, global market competition. But we can also talk about regional uh, or branding of regions. Uh, it can happen uh, using different kind of administrative levels. In France, it will be a department branding. Uh, in Britain, it will be a county branding. Um, so it, it depends on basically a kind of local flavor. Um, and ways in which uh, branding is basically applied by local authorities. Um, so place branding is a kind of generic term uh, that helps authorities uh, to make sense of the identity of this particular place uh, in order to encapsulate it and capture it in a way that is basically presents the place as not only relevant, uh, but offers um, a sense of uh, unique selling proposition uh, that is blended and mixed with a sense of storytelling, uh, that is mixed and blended with a, a desire to basically develop a place, or at least give this particular place a sense of orientation and a direction uh, in which particular place is um, supposed, uh, supposed to be going and supposed to be developing. Now, the, the reason I say that the term is slightly contentious uh, is because, um, well, it, it kind of to do with human perception, not only of places, but also practices. And I'm sure some of those aspects of uh, the tensions, particularly between nation branding, which happens uh, very clearly and vividly and explicitly in the case of uh, what we're seeing now in uh, China, vis-a-vis uh, -vis city branding. Uh, in other words, a ways in which basically um, the local authorities of Beijing are trying to, uh, in conjunction with national uh, government present China uh, to the world. Now, one thing I kind of really wanted to add to what I have just said is that um, branding uh, in itself um, or nation branding uh, or city branding is about application of marketing communication techniques and strategies um, into ways in which particular destination uh, or place is presented. Um, Interestingly, the idea of a national brand or a city brand um, has got a, a little bit more of a holistic resonance. In other words, it's a way in which various uh, publics, stakeholders, audiences, however way we would like to look at it, um, receives that particular place. Now, what it means in practice is that branding messages do not always correspond with ways in which basically particular place is um, uh, presented or represented um, and received by uh, by audiences, uh, because there is more to uh, ways in which particular places present themselves. Uh, so we can talk about additional practices that basically well, are. It, it, no, I think that's a good place. There's a lot to unpack there as you're starting to get into practices. I, I think that would be a good place to pivot into our practitioners for a second here. Thanks for sure. giving us that backdrop, um, Pavel. Um, 
Um, you know, I, I've picked up from this, you know, the contentiousness of the concept because it has to deal with human perception. Um, it, I, I, I pick up that it's there's there's application of branding practices, um, marketing communications technique and strategies. Um, and I'm now interested to hear about how this looks on the ground with our practitioners. Elliot, tell us about what Destination DC does for uh, Washington DC um, and, and what your you know, branding, if we can call it that, involves. Yeah, absolutely. I, I appreciate Pavel's perspective on, on the uh, textbook version of branding because he's clearly you know, spot on. Um, you know, there's always the 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 uh, application of it, um, which continues to change. And really, when you when I think about branding, it's really telling the story, what people think they know versus what we want them to know. Um, as an organization that focuses on economic development through tourism, um, you know, there's two facets of economic development. You're either trying to get industry to relocate to your destination, stay forever and ever, bring people to the city like Amazon is doing across the river, or in our case, People come for three to five days and then leave. Uh, the question is who stays longer, who spends more, and what's their perception? And so from our, as we look at marketing and branding, uh, it's more along the lines of what people think they know about our destination, uh, monuments, memorials, and museums. From a global perspective, every day there's someone um, in front of uh, a, an official building talking politics, and people who grew up with that their entire lives. And if they've never come to Washington, D.C., their perception is, we're coming for monuments, memorials, museums, the American experience, take a picture in front of the White House and then go somewhere else fun. So mm -hmm. my branding is tied to DC cool. What do people not know about Washington? And it helped for us when Forbes named us America's coolest city. Um, and so when we came up with DC cool, you know, I love the fact that, you know, the, the press is like, is DC cool? And that's what we focused on in regards to our branding. Another good example, Las Vegas. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Their branding continued to change. When people went to Vegas 20 years ago, they went for gaming. But now people go for the food scene, for, for a show, um, and the list goes on and on. And gaming has changed, uh, has, has not, is no longer the number one reason why people go to Vegas. So branding for us is telling the story uh, and telling the story in a way where it, it really gets people engaged and curious about coming to Washington, whether they're coming for a day and then all of a sudden now they're staying for three or four days because they realize we have rivers uh, and there are outdoor activities in which you can do and we don't all live in 50 stories, the skyscrapers, which is what our office in China tells us that the folks there think of our destination. So it's really telling the story and giving a perception of Washington as a destination. And I'll end by saying, you know, from a, a national level, Brand USA is the organization that focuses on telling the story about the US to the global community. And it's only 10 years old, not even 10 years old. So their name brand is in it because they're looking at how do we promote the, the destination, the US as a whole and the territories and tell that story in a holistic way. Thank you, Elliot. That was great. And it gives us a picture into the work that you do. I know you travel far and wide and um, and you see other cities kind of doing what you're doing here in Washington for Washington. Um, and uh, Claire, I wanted to turn this over to you now because you do strategic communications as a line of work. It's a profession. And, um, you know, I gather that, you know, sometimes you're having to deal with multiple stories about a, an event or a place in particular, and you've got to find a way to kind of draw all these um, parallel narratives into something that is going to resonate and stick and also work to the advantage of your client. Um, so tell us a little bit about some of the, 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 the challenges of that work and, uh, and what you face, especially when you're dealing with Brand Washington. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, kind of what everybody already said is, you know, spot on. I think, you know, when you build a brand, it's basically be a, a making a statement about who you are, who you want to be and what you want to accomplish. And I do think or how you want to be perceived and also, you know, as you go through that process for communications or marketing, you also decide, you know, who do you want to buy into that brand? Who are you looking to resonate with? Um, in the case of economic development, like what companies, people are you looking to attract and retain? 
um, to have the workforce here? And what do you want people to believe in, whether that's, you know, a cause, a reason to take action, a candidate, if I'm doing, you know, kind of political work. Um, but the, the brand is really like that first step of coming up with the overarching vision of what you want to treat. But there is that part two that then is like building, advancing, and, uh, you know, protecting that brand and really making it real. And that is taking the steps, whether it is through policy, whether it's through communication strategies, to, to advance that vision consistently, because you can't just sell it, you also have to back it up. Um, so in a lot of ways, you know, like what Elliot was talking about, you know, the proposition is DC is cool. I've lived here now for 12 years. I love it here. I, I think it's better all the time, you know, and you can go out and kayak and uh, so many fun things. The restaurants are amazing um, and everything like that, but a lot of effort and policy and a lot of work goes into then, you know, protecting and making sure that the restaurants are doing well making sure that the marketing and people know that this new exciting food scene is going on, no, not only here, but um, other places as well. Um, being on food list, being on is your city cool list. Those are a lot of communications and marketing strategies, but then also, you know, um, I think back to the Amazon bid, one of the things I worked on was um, the Metro Now coalition campaign, which is the first of its kind a uh, regional coalition to secure dedicated funding for the metro system here. And, you know, as we were looking to bring possibly Amazon HQ2 to the area, you know, if you want to have the best workforce, you got to be able to get them from point A to point B and you have to have a functioning metro. Metro system was a huge part of that. So um, ensuring that the region worked together to secure that dedicated funding to make sure that system work, that's an important piece of making, you know, the overarching brand work and the buy-in. So there's a lot of levels that go into it. Um, it's not just the communications part. You really do have to be able to back it up. Yeah. A lot of work well, goes into that. <laughs> yeah. And, and I want to probe a little bit deeper into the substance of that work. But before I go any further, I just want to repost the link here that I posted at the beginning of the session. If you've come in late um, to our conversation, I'm um, in, in, asking people to engage in a little bit of audience participation. So um, that link has been posted again. Now, uh, back to Claire and Elliot about um, some of the, um, the substance of the work, because I would wager that you are you know, contending with a lot of different perceptions of Washington when you get outside the Beltway. There's always news um, circulating about Washington that's not particularly favorable to Washington. Um, and, and that deals a lot with our political class and our political machinery. Um, we had the January 6th um, event. Um, and, you know, the, the branding of Washington is, is unsavory, un, you know, um, you know, not, not, not unwholesomely positive things. Um, so, you know, how, there's a lot that goes into this work and, and I don't want to approach it lightly. Like you just arrive at a kind of association and just say, yes, we're going to run with it. Cool DC, you know? Um, so tell us a little bit more about like how you're able to kind of get out in front of public perception or multiple public perceptions of the place. And, and that, um, you know, that your brand seeks to address, you know, the, you know, the noise, but also tries to locate that signal. It elevates that great signal that you really want to promote about, about Washington. And I'll just hand it off to either of you to get us started there. Claire, you want to go first? <laughs> sure. sure. Um, I just, I think just, you know, as you're coming up with the brand, it really sort of sets that North star of who do you want to be? And then a lot of those things go in underneath the brand. And then you've got to be continually working towards being true to that brand, understanding that brand, selling that brand locally with the buy-in, I think as well, um, to get people to say, this is who we are, you know, and this is who we want to be. And this is why we want to have a great metro system is because, you know, we don't want to just be known as the federal city. They, we want to have other private sector businesses here as well. And we want those to thrive. And we, we're, we're more than that. And, you know, in order to do that, you know, just understanding, I think, and having that vision and North Star helps to move people in the right direction to ultimately achieving that vision and goal. And it, it takes sustained 
committed work, as you mentioned, on a number of workflows, whether, you know, to track the top workforce, you know, you have to have good transportation, you have to address housing affordability, the place has to be fun. Um, there are just so many different aspects that go that go into it. But I think if you build the brand, um, not not to be cliche, but you know, if you build it, they will come <laughs> type of thing. It was coming. But I think, I, but I do think it's really, really important to kind of um, have a clear vision and a lot of work goes into creating these brands as well about who you want to be as well as who you do not want to be. And, and there's a lot of work that goes into creating those brands and why it's authentic to your place and what you're trying to achieve. Elliot, you want to build on that? Yeah, I'll just say that, you know, the, the reality with branding, especially for a destination, is that one size does not fit all. You know, I started off by talking about economic development. You know, selfishly, we want people to come to what we want everyone to come to Washington. Wink, wink. We do. Uh, but we want to influence those that will stay longer and spend more. That's the international market. We know that China is the largest market for D.C. in terms of international visitation. And every Chinese visitor spends about six thousand dollars per person versus a domestic visitor spends about, you know, anywhere from five hundred to twelve hundred. And it depends on the economics. So there's a lot of data, a lot of research that's done as we're looking at our branding, how we brand. You know, we have offices in five different countries and how we brand Washington or promote D.C., D.C. cool in China, uh, a country, whereas our politics doesn't really resonate as a negative reason to visit or not, um, is different than how we talk to our office in Brazil. You, know, you referenced not, um, January 6th. I, mo I, I moved to D.C. Uh, December 2001, right after 9-11. So you think 9-11, you think anthrax, you think sniper, which was on the news today, six government shutdowns, January 6th, and then every single time something happens uh, on a terrorism level globally, it affects Washington, D.C., because the perception is we're, we're next or we're a target. And arguably we are. So you look at all those negative things and you try to focus on things that are that resonate as positive reasons of, to visit the city. Um, and but you you have to recognize the fact that how we are doing our marketing now, which is more regional because domestic travelers of, you know, up until November 8th of last year were the only visitors that we had coming to Washington, D.C. Um, and we love domestic visitors, especially when they're the only ones coming. That marketing was different. It was a target of people that live within a four hour radius of Washington. So as we look at our branding and look at that market that will be coming for outdoor activities, which you can do that in Washington, D.C., but how do we get them to look at us above and beyond the government or the federal experience? Um, and that is a huge part of what we focus on as we look at um, targeting specific audiences. And then and, and that conversation changes as we look at the meetings market domestically and internationally. So, um, and then of course, as we look at DEI, you know, we have, we have branding that's specific to the LGBTQ community and other things and other reasons why Washington is such a unique destination that we want to expose people to, reminding the local community that our marketing is not segmented to LGBTQ simply because that market wants to go to those events. Because as you look at today's society, a gay club today could be 60% LGBTQ and 40%, you know, other groups of people that just want to come together. So we, we market those things and our branding differently. Also recognizing that, again, looking at China as a destination, when we talk about the rich diversity of Washington, that does not resonate at all with the Chinese. They don't care. They, it's like, why are you talking to us about diversity? Whereas when we're saying that to folks in a different region of the world, that is a big deal. So you, you have to you know, think along the lines of segmenting your marketing, segmenting your branding for those particular audiences. And what we've learned over the last two years is to turn on a dime out of necessity when there are variables that, that you have to react to. We've had several in Washington. I thank you, Elliot. I, I want to um, turn to um, something that's get, that you're talking about. It's getting me thinking about, you know, the ways in which we um, measure the effectiveness, right? You know, you have your campaigns and uh, your messaging and, you know, you're looking for a sign that it's actually doing what you hoped it would do. 
And on this point, I want to bring Pavel back into the discussion here. And, you know, I recall back in the, in the mid nineties when, um, when branding of, of places, you know, specifically the nation branding literature, and I'm thinking of the work of Simon Anholt and how, um, he made that relevant. It, it was, you know, taking it beyond just kind of economics and tourism and development type of, um, draw for places, but, but for politics, right? Um, to make politics go down easier or smoother, that a, that a city or country could kind of store up a kind of bank of goodwill and then uh, draw on that bank of goodwill when things go bad. So, um, so talk about a little bit about how um, we know that, um, or the methods that we use to assess the, the, the place brand um, from, a, from a, a scholarly point of view. Okay, so before I answer a question, let me just add a little bit of context to what you said and what I'm about to say. Uh, I'm an academic, I guess I like context. Uh, it comes with the territory, I guess. Um, I mean, it, um, the bank of goodwill, which I think is a fantastic way of actually capturing uh, the reputational matters in interdiplomatic relations or international uh, relations, um, stems from or comes from diplomacy. That's how nations speak to each other. Um, that's my view. I basically take the view that basically most of the communication that happens between uh, between nations happens through uh, well-established, long-lasting communication channels. Um, but um, Simon Anhalt was attempting to kind of revolutionize it and basically uh, bring uh, marketing uh, into the mix. Uh, and uh, his ideas basically resulted in the introduction of um, one of the first uh, tools that policymakers found appealing, namely nation branding index, uh, which quite a lot of people are still looking at. Uh, it's an indicator of where countries are at in terms of competitiveness of their brands, perceptions of the brands, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, there are other rankings by now. There is a good country index. There are uh, different uh, soft power indices that, uh, that basically uh, uh, different organizations and con consultancies all around the world have produced, uh, and they're relevant to, to different audiences. So one way in answer to your question of actually looking at uh, reputations and capturing particularly the holistic aspects of uh, national branding is by looking at rankings. Uh, if you indeed believe in the quality uh, and the soundness of the methods. Now, I cannot have done for the purpose of this talk a little bit of a literature review, and uh, I went through uh, what has been happening in the literature, nation branding literature, in a kind of last couple, a couple of years. Um, and the field is becoming quite sophisticated in terms of capturing the effectiveness of messages. Uh, so, uh, scholars have been using traditional social science methods, uh, looking at, for example, how terrorist threats and uh, political instability impacts the destination brand uh, perceptions. And here, obviously, I'm not going to uh, be very revealing when I say that the traditional surveys are being used to capture that uh, particular aspect of uh, reputation of uh, countries. Uh, now, amongst the kind of more sophisticated developments is machine learning uh, that is being used in destination marketing. In other words, way of scrutinizing and capturing uh, large chunks of uh, consumer um, data, uh, processing it uh, using machine learning technology and basically looking at the user generated content uh, to capture the factors that feed into reputations of a particular place on the one hand, but also looking at the sentiments. In other words, what people are saying in, in those vast, uh, vastly con connected, uh, collected data sets. Uh, that's something that has been done recently as well. Interestingly, in relations to uh, one of the new skiing resorts that has been built for the purpose of 2020 Olympics. I just uh, found a study today that is quite uh, fascinating, but there are also other ways. If we're interested in the reception of brand messages, here scholars have been using focus groups interviews, uh, scholars have been using visual aids uh, in order to facilitate some of those um, uh, some of those uh, uh, some of those methods on a smaller scale. Um, also, discourse analysis is one of the ways of looking at uh, the architecture of uh, of a brand. In other words, finding alignments because uh, essentially 
and this is something that Claire has uh, very eloquently emphasized, branding is not only about the message, it's about alignment with policies and alignment with the way we really, really want to um, present ourselves to the audience, which is something that Elliot kept emphasizing. Uh, and this alignment is very frequently analyzed by means of uh, discursive linguistic analysis uh, of how people receive the messages, how those messages are formulated as policy objectives and how they actually deliver uh, by uh, practitioners such as Claire and Elliot and their respective teams. And so, Elliot, when Forbes says that DC is the coolest city, um, what do you think that they found that DC did so well? Or what do you think that, that you've been doing so well that's really, and I want to say this by way of another kind of parallel campaign, which looks a lot like this one. Of course, I don't have a lot of fam like familiarity with either campaign except for the branding. But I'll tell you that um, I know that, that Italy, the Italian embassy here in the city, is, is adopting a similar kind of cool motif for their own um, upcoming campaign, right? Italy is, Italy is cool. So, so it's, you know, it's young, it's innovative, it's moving, it's going places, it's fresh. Um, and so I, I, I can understand that there are a lot of, you know, really attractive associations to that. But, you know, Forbes, of course, came up with their own methodology for arriving at you at number one. So what do you think is, is um, are the, you know, the, the factors that are, taking DC to the top of the list? Well, one, I take full credit for it. <laughs> As you should. As I should. Of course, so, of course. <laughs> well, two, two things. One, um, like in high school, it's never cool to call yourself cool. So, you know, and so therefore, you know, anytime you do a marketing campaign, you know, when we came out with DC Cool, it was before Forbes named us the coolest city. So the, so the, you know, the the media, which we appreciate the press because, you know, press can be turned, you know, there's always going to be a naysayer. You turn that into an opportunity to talk about how cool DC is. When Forbes, using their metrics, an organization that traditionally doesn't look at specific metrics tied to hospitality, that really validated and gave people more insight as to, well, maybe we should think differently about Washington because we're always thinking politics, wearing a suit, um, but we never think about all these other things. And it was basically opening a door for us to go through and talk about, you know, why, you know, people that move to DC think we're, we all think we're cool that live here, but um, what makes us such a great and cool destination? Italy is gonna do the same thing. We know food, we know wine, uh, uh, we know um, um, uh, couture, all the things that make Italy unique, but it's also long-term history. So how are, how are you tying that into a younger audience that's wanting to come to a country that's steeped in, in tradition and give it a younger appeal? That's what we focus on. And, um, you know, so we, we look at the metrics, you know, Claire referenced earlier, you know, what are the local stakeholders interested in? They want to know if, and, and we're not part of government, you know, and I say that in a positive way because we are given the opportunity to promote our destination minus the gobbledygook of, you know, talking to politicians about what we do. But at the same time, we utilize Pavel's perspective in terms of measuring the success of a campaign. You know, everything that we do is measured and we don't do it ourselves. But again, of course, they're going to say, sure, Elliot, you're going to say your campaign was successful. We also recognize, just like Italy will, that people inherently want to go to Italy because it's Italy. I got engaged in Italy. I go every single year. I love it. But the question is, who above and beyond those that automatically will come are you trying to influence? And who is coming for business reasons domestically and internationally? Are you influencing and their families to say, well, I want to go because I heard about this amazing new exhibit, or I want to go for a sporting event or something else that's happening in Washington, and you're expanding their perspectives. So the press gives us a chance to, and we've done so many unique things. I've done a campaign, I know we don't have time to talk about it, that whereas our mayor hated it. And I said, thank God you hate it. You're over 70. It's not for you. It's for a group of people that look at DC the way you look at it. They want to come for tradition and all the other stuff. We don't want that. We want people to come and look at us through a different lens and 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 channel uh, a newer audience that has a larger economic uh, ability to spend money in our destination. And that's really at the end of the day what it's all about. 
I want to one thing I love about DC. I will just say really quickly. I think the whole DC Cool was also, you know, what demographic were you trying to attract and like younger, more vibrant, creative, innovative. I think a lot of people are really excited to come here and realize that you could, you know, do social change and do a lot of, you know, exciting things here. And through the DC Cool campaign, I think, you know, it's it's knowing the audience also that you want to attract, and then. Um, not only how do you attract them, but then thinking very futuristically about how do you retain them for the long haul and keep it keep it growing underneath the brand. So I think that was also from the onset talks about how, you know, having that North Star and the vision from the front end of what you want to create, not what was, but what will be. And how do you build that for the long term? I think economic development is always very future focused. So I think the branding campaign kind of, you know, set the tone for that, which was really exciting. All right, happy to hear that. Hey, I, I want to just say one um, thing. In about six or seven minutes, I'm going to open it up for questions. So um, if you're out there and you have questions for our panelists, um, please keep them coming. I've got some coming in and, um, and you know, we're going to change over pretty soon and um, open up the, you know, the discussion to your questions. So, um, um, just um, feel free to send them forward. Um, I, I want to come back to this, um, you know, this who's your audience and, uh, you know, type of thing, because I, I you know, I, I recognize the centrality of that to make these brand campaigns work is you've got to know who you're talking to. But what about something like Metro Claire? You know, like we're talking about a public transportation system, which is regional, not just, you know, relevant to the city. Um, you know, who are we trying to reach, you know, when, when we're doing strategic communications for a, you know, a, a mass transit system, you know, that, that is used up and down, you know, the demographics and all over the place. In that specific situation, um, you know, what had to change was policy that were being put in place and um, the policies out of DC, Maryland, Virginia had to sort of match and pass out at the same time. So, you know, you really were targeting the lawmakers in those situations. And, you know, you have to explain stuff to them as well about what you're trying to do and what, what is working and why this would be beneficial, um, not only to their state, but also to all of their, their citizens and why this would be impactful and how this could, you know, set them up for long-term success. So it's really articulating those positions, not only to move things maybe as a narrative in the press, but also, you know, advancing policies that are in alignment with that vision and making everybody understand and, and on the same page. And I think with, you know, stuff that goes on these days, you know, you need the public, the nonprofits, you know, individuals and lawmakers all on the same page to actually enact and make change happen. So I really think um, in that case, this was the policymakers, but everybody has, has a role, role to play. And it's really about putting all those pieces together. And I think brand helps to tie that overarching vision together for everybody about what we're going for and what we're looking to accomplish. Yeah. And I, and I really appreciate, you know, the, the fact that you've highlighted, you know, that that campaign was really targeting the lawmakers, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a different audience that we're trying to reach with a campaign like that. Whereas Elliot is trying to reach, as you said early on, Elliot, you know, we want everybody to come to DC. So as many, but also, you know, by branding DC cool, you know, we, we want a certain kind of energy to be entering DC in droves and present a picture of DC that is going to invite that, uh, that, that group into the city and be excited about it. Um, you know, there's something that was mentioned in the beginning though. And I think, um, uh, you know, the, um, the, the point that was made, I can't remember if it was Pavel or Claire, but there was something made about, um, probably was Pavel, about the point about having the, you know, in, in so many words, the substance really match up with the message, right? That what it is that you're talking about is going to be um, reinforced by the experience. And it's not always the case that that message that emanates outwardly from the city or the country is is really being um, upheld, you know, by the, the place itself. Um, I just, you know, a, a second, Pavel, about the dangers of having a message that's out of step with the the facts on the ground, um, because there are lots of cases of that. Um, well. <laughs> I suppose one of the best ways of assessing the effectiveness of the campaigns is basically just kind of gauging the momentum of them and the initial reception. And there's plenty of uh, campaigns that basically 
have been launched. Uh, and uh, basically, they just became an examples of uh, a handbook examples of how not to do branding or why not to do branding in the way that it was it was done. So, um, I just want to focus on Olympics for a second, if I may. Beijing 2020 Olympics, um, and in the same fashion as Ellie's campaign was uh, talked about by Forbes in a very positive, uh, positive manner, positive fashion. Um, the Times talked about uh, the. Olympics and uh, way in which the event was uh, presented. And uh, the Chinese president basically voted uh, the event uh, and described it as being green, inclusive, open, and corruption-free. Um, and that kind of sets the tones for, uh, and sets the expectations for what the international audiences can actually uh, hope for. Um, and given the context in which Olympics is basically taking place, uh, we're already seeing this mismatch uh, that a lot of journalists are already reporting about and audiences are talking about. I mean, it's bad enough that we uh, have got, uh, or China faces the challenge of organizing uh, Olympics during COVID times. Uh, but one of the biggest problems uh, is obviously the sustainability uh, of Olympics. And uh, President uh, himself wants to basically use that as a platform for advancing the green credibility uh, but at the end of the day, it kind of comes across as a message that uh, there's basically a greenwashing message uh, because of the discrepancy between the way that Olympics is being covered internationally uh, and what China has done, the effort that China has put into producing uh, artificial snow. 1.2 million cubics of snow was produced in a place that basically doesn't have a natural conditions uh, for Winter Olympics in the first place. Uh, then, on the top of that, to make matter even more complicated, Beijing is one of those cities that suffers uh, from ongoing problems with its own water supplies. Uh, so how is this even green? Uh, and also, how is this even inclusive when we think about the situations of uh, Muslim minorities in the country is, is also something that, uh, that is uh, very much contentious and controversial. But when it comes to the uh, kind of historical campaigns that didn't really work very well, uh, I'll just give you two examples of campaigns from United Kingdom. The first campaign that was ever launched, the nation branding campaign, uh, it was called Cool Britannia. Uh, and it was basically deemed as a kind of archetypical nation branding campaign. And um, it was basically pretty much uh, killed by British journalists. It did not gain the traction that, uh, that the policymakers and the campaigners wanted it to gain. Uh, it basically, there was no buy-in from the domestic audiences, particularly from left-wing press in the United Kingdom. Uh, and very frequently the campaign basically simply lost the momentum uh, and it faded away. So historically, it's a kind of a campaign to look at because it's one of the first European campaigns that was actually launched and efforts have been put in to present Britain rather than um, conservative history focused place as a modern forward looking and progressive uh, European country. Um, that didn't quite work because, because there was no internal buying into it. So um, I've got a lot of other examples, but I'm sure um, yeah, I, I, I want to I want to close it there because I want to get to questions. But before I get to questions, it's almost as if you got to the back end of our little word cloud exercise, Pavel, because I'm going to take you there and I want you to see um, what the collective came up with when they asked about their associations of Beijing. And so you can okay. see what stands out as the, the loudest pollution pollution mm. and the Olympics and then Tiananmen Square and then communism, Forbidden City, you know, those are the ones that seem to come in with the greatest amount of frequency. Um, you know, and we've got the, the environmental challenge, the political challenge, the ideological um, you know, system that governs China. And of course, the, the, the event going on right now, which is really putting China front and center on, on the global stage. So I think that's really interesting based on what you said. Um, any other hot take on what you're looking at here? Yeah, I, I love it. I, I mean, it's sadly for, for Beijing, 2008, to Pavel's point, was amazing for Beijing and for the country of China because it was so diplomatic. One, it was exceptional, the opening and everything else tied to it. But we, we grew up, you know, you had, you had years of a, the reality of communism, which was not welcoming at all and communism still isn't but at the same time it changed the perception of china whereas 
the global community looked at it differently and they saw it through tourism. Whereas now, you know, one, the air quality in, in China, especially in Beijing, especially during the winter, is horrible. And, um, and their record tied to it, the global community is more aware of our need to focus on sustainability and other things tied to our, to our, our, our globe. And China is just not, um, they're not in a position and a positive position from a global perspective. So it's interesting as to how it's being perceived now. That's notwithstanding the political climate there right now. Hmm. I'm going to move us into questions now. Um, Elliot and Claire, I think this one is teed up nicely for the two of you. This is a question from Sandra in Colombia. And uh, the question is that DC Cool has been successful for many years. There's also the United Kingdom's Great Campaign, which has also been going on for a long time. But here in Colombia, there is no long-term strategy. It changes from administration to administration. How do you decide when it is time to change the brand? It's, for us, it's more along the lines of refreshing the brand. And uh, DC Cool, which is almost a decade old, has been refreshed with experience, the real DC, um, which is also, it's a, it's a continuation of DC Cool, which doesn't go away. You know, when you think of Virginia's for Lovers or I Love New York, I Heart New York, those are 50 years old, you know, but what, hap what, what continues to happen? You know, Vegas is probably the most notable for changing campaigns and changing the perception, whereas what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, in Vegas is no longer used but it's also the most recognized. Um, for us, we're now looking at Experience DC because we're like, well, now that we've told you that we're cool, and again, it's never good for us to tell you, it's good for the global community, journalists to come in to talk about DC in a cool, cool way. We want you to experience the real DC. Um, in countries, whereas you've got a lot of variables, politics being one of them, it's a lot harder. Um, and um, sometimes you can, you know, folks are willing to look beyond the politics of a country and still visit that country because of other reasons. And I think that that's something that, you know, I know global communities and we all talk, you know, it's a small community, um, whereas, you know, we're talking about how I'm promoting DC versus how the, the, the individual that represents Greece uh, is promoting that country, you know, through all the positives and negatives. So you gotta, you gotta look at all those things find a way to refresh and figure out what will be appealing to individuals. Safety being number one. Hmm. Claire, do you want to add anything to that? Nope, I think that was fantastic. <laughs> well, here's another question that um, covers, I, I think this is going to be a, a number of questions consolidated into one. And um, a lot of people are ask, asking about how DC um, reaches very specific audiences. And um, I've seen a question here about the international student audience. I've seen another question about the Chinese tourist market. Um, there's another question about uh, responsible branding, right? Like having a branding campaign that is inclusive. Um, Elliot, you were talking before about marketing in a way that reaches the LGBTQ um, community, but there's also um, a lot of apparent classism going on in DC as well, um, that there's concern about the cost of living in DC, um, marginalizing um, populations because it's just too unaffordable to live here. So what about the responsibilities of, of branding um, you know, in, done in such a way that, that doesn't shut people out? Um, well, I answer that. Uh, it, it really ties into what I can what I can control and influence versus what I can't. Because as a destination is doing well economically, you know, you're going to see inherently a rise in the cost of living. You're going to see inherently a rise in an interest in moving to a destination. So, you know, I I recognize. Uh, from an economic perspective, that DC is not the cheapest city, but most world-class cities are not. And that is something that, that I cannot tackle, but I'm aware of it, especially as we're looking at people that work in the industry. Um, but I can focus on, you know, the, the diversity, how we promote DC. And even on our website, we've been more purposeful in terms of a, you know, tying, promoting DC into diversity, equity, and inclusion tying in DC into the black experience, which in my opinion 
is uniquely separate from, but also part of DEI. So, you know, how are we telling that story in a way where it resonates with individuals that they want to visit? You know, right now, protest tourism. You know, 2020 was a pivotal, pivotal year as it pertains to dealing with the dynamics of the, the, our country. Now individuals want to come to see the first Black Lives Matter Plaza in the world. And now there are others. They want to come to see how the experience of 2020, which is still influencing, I hope, how people are dealing with, with racial equity and inclusion, but how we're capturing it in a way where individuals can come and, and, and experience that. Um, so, you know, it, it continues to evolve, again, realizing that there's some things I can control and there's some things I simply cannot. Hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you for that, Elliot. Um, there's also some questions here about, um, you know, people wanting like further reference, you know, for, you know, just wanting to know more about how place branding works. I think there's also some interest arising from the, the questions about your uh, about just backgrounds in general, like how how people come into this kind of work and what sort of qualifications one needs in order to, to do this work. Um, Claire, do you want to just say a little bit about how how you came into Stratcom and um, you know your journey there? Sure. Um, I was I was an English major uh, at at Michigan, and um, in addition to that, I was also an, an athlete at Michigan, which provided me the opportunity. Um, I was very fortunate, you know, to do a lot of media and communications. You know, we were on the radio. We were a representative, actually, of the University of Michigan athletics brand, you know, that leaders and best brand and buying into that and all of that type of stuff. So I think just my, my background and upbringing there, like provided me with a very good base. And then, um, you know, I came here and I worked in the Senate, which was a really um, natural progression to sort of, you know, not do it for a university, but for individuals, you know, what is their brand and then understanding how do you take an issue or a message to a state either to win a campaign to explain um, what is happening in DC to a local audience and understanding very clearly how to segment that message appropriately, you know? Um, for example, you know, what you say in Miami and Florida might be a little different than what you would say in the panhandle in Florida, but really understanding media markets, the importance of place and tailoring your message and how to do the overarching message as well as targeted messaging. And I think when it comes to place that, you know, as we talked about today, there are just a lot of facets that go into, um, you know, with, I would just say sort of like a strong brand comes a lot of visibility, a platform that enables an individual or company to really be able to get their message out to a wide audience. And so I think kind of um, learning how to do that uh, in the Senate was very, very helpful for me um, from the messaging perspective. It's an art form, definitely. <laughs> Um, and then after that, I actually ended up working on um, regional regional economic development with the 2030 group. And also, you know, I was very fortunate to be around a lot of really good people who taught me taught me a lot of stuff. And so I would also encourage people just, you know, if you like something to continue learning more, reading more, refining your skills. And I kind of think that you end up where you're where where you need to be um, if you sort of stay true to that and you listen to that and always be open to learning more and from everybody around you because you always can. Elliot, I know before you came to DC, you were in Atlanta um, and another Olympic city. Um, so you've been in this field for a long time. Um, any other sage words of um, what to take with you as you go along your journey into this, uh, this line of work? Yeah, I mean, most people that do what I do fell into this industry. I knew nothing about it. Um, I think that there's so many, you know, as you think about hospitality, most people think of either working in a restaurant or working in a hotel and being a frontline employee. They don't think about, you know, uh, being an economist or being an architect or looking at all the other um, opportunities that exist. You know, I've been in, in the industry for 34 years um, and for most of the audience, that's much longer than you've been on this earth. And, um, you know, I knew that it was, you know, I, I had no idea that this industry existed as a career field. Yeah. And when I was pursued to enter this industry, I ran from the guy because I said, I'm, I'm insulted that he thinks that I want to be a tour guide. Not that there's anything wrong with being a tour guide, but that was, you know, and, and um, so there was a lot that I had to learn. 
Um, and um, now the industry is faced with, you know, we had the perception problem before and now we're faced with the reality of, you know, were we the first to, to, to go under um, when COVID hit and are there opportunities and will we be able to retain talent or, re or get that talent to come back because of the fear of um, what happens when the next um, disruptor might happen in, in, you know, from a global perspective. So, but I love this industry. It, it's great, you know, just from the perspective of, you know, Pavel and what he brings to the table and, and you know, and, and Claire and how she entered the industry and, and everyone has an experience where they can tie it into hospitality indirectly. Um, and then if they're in the industry, you know, you're going to be in it forever because it's amazing. Pavel, before we close, I just wanted to see if you could offer, you know, there are a couple of people asking here about a starter set of sorts into, you know, learning more about this um, as a field of study and practice. Um, any quick references that you would offer to our listeners for where they might turn? Um, well, obviously, the best place to study this kind of stuff is uh, my department, uh, Department of Journalism Study at the University of Sheffield. <laughs> uh, so that's a short answer. Paul's <laughs> um, good on his branding. Yes, on brand, <laughs> on point. As he should be. Yeah. Um, the, the, the long answer is uh, uh, basically uh, publications of, 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 of colleagues that basically I see on academic circuit. Uh, people that basically have published on Asian branding. So the work of Nadia Kaneva, uh, Melissa Aronczyk, James Pament, uh, they are uh, kind of leading figures in that field, uh, uh, pioneers uh, and uh, younger scholars basically kind of follow the footsteps. Uh, Nation branding, generally speaking, is kind of fascinating. It's becoming a little bit uh, blended into broader uh, discussions about soft power, uh, so uh, literature about uh, and scholarship uh, about uh, international politics and um, uh, and other types of practices, public diplomacy, propaganda, uh, the dirty word that is thrown into the mix uh, also exists there. Um, so all of that creates a very very in interesting and eclectic mishmash, um, and the field is certainly growing and developing into. Uh, a rather interesting area of study. And we talk to practitioners. We like practitioners a lot. Yeah. It keeps us on our toes. And uh, uh, I think m most scholars in, in this field who basically um, appreciate the significance and the impact of, of, of branding or similar practices, they, they develop relationships with practitioners through research and, and professional contact. So um, thank you for having me. Uh, that yeah. was another opportunity too to meet some uh, more practitioners. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, an, that's, I think, an opportune time for us to bring us to a close here. We're at 1231. So let me just um, thank our panelists first for your excellent insights, for fielding these questions, for sharing um, all the work that you're doing out there in advancing our understanding. So thank you, Elliot. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Pavel, for joining us today. Thank you. Yes, Thanks for having pleasure. me. Yeah. Pleasure. And, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, and before we close out, um, I just want to thank our audience for your participation, for your questions, for populating that great word cloud that we had. And, um, and we encourage you to attend our next SIS event, which is called Who Governs the Internet? <laughs> <laughs>